Did you know that there was a black passenger on the Titanic? A lot of people don't know that. Some people who do know talk about a black family that traveled on the Titanic. And that's just not the case. There was Joseph LaRoche, his white French wife, and two biracial daughters. The distinction is important because class mattered as much as when getting on the Titanic as when getting off of it in 1912. And that's if you were one of the ones who was lucky enough to make it off of the Titanic into a lifeboat. So it is highly likely that part of the reason that Mrs. LaRoche was able to make it to safety into a lifeboat with her two daughters is because to the naked eye, they were all just three white females who didn't appear to be black. To any of the crew members who were just helping passengers get off of the Titanic before she sank, Mrs. LaRoche was just a second-class passenger with two white daughters. Another reason that it is important to make the distinction that Joseph LaRoche's family was not a black family, but a mixed-race family, is that there would come a time when Mrs. LaRoche would literally bury every trace of blackness that was attached to her and her daughters through her husband. And that is something that a black woman with two black daughters simply would not have been able to do. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous stories from yesteryear that make Ty's Hot Mess History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream. And comment, I subscribed, in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now, on to why you are here. Around the time of the release of this story, it is the 111th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, which happened in April of 1912. And when the Titanic went down, so did its only black passenger on board, Joseph LaRoche. In the few places where I've seen his name regarding Titanic, most of the titles or headlines read something along the lines of the only black family on the Titanic, or the Titanic's only black family, something like that. While I can appreciate that people are telling the story of the LaRoche family, I think that knowing that the family was interracial and not black is important. In this 1912 setting, perception was reality, and class mattered. Even though Joseph LaRoche was a well-educated man from an influential family, the perception about him, because of his skin color, would have made it hard for his fellow Titanic passengers to believe that the background that he had really was his background. We'll get to that. The white and mixed identities of his wife and daughters respectively likely played a large role in their making it off of the Titanic and into a lifeboat. And the fact that his daughters were white passing, meaning that to the naked eye, they looked like white children, who no one would second guess as being black or partially black, meant that the rest of his family could bury his black existence so that all of them, his wife and daughters, could live their lives as white women. Not only could they do that, they did, years after the Titanic sank. Again, perception was and is reality. Joseph's wife, Juliette Lafargue, was a white French woman. When the family traveled on the Titanic, the couple had two very young girls, toddlers, Simone and Louise, and Juliet was pregnant with a third child. It is actually because of their daughters that the couple chose to travel on the Titanic. Originally, Joseph's mother gifted them with first-class tickets for a steamship called La France, which had a rule that children had to be in the ship's nursery during meal times but they traded in those first-class tickets for second-class tickets on the Titanic. Because on the Titanic, their daughters could stay in their care all day long for the entire voyage. In case you are wondering how a black woman, Joseph's mother, could afford to purchase such an extravagant gift as first-class tickets on a cruise ship in 1912, let me give you a little background information on Joseph and his family. Joseph's mother, Anne LaRoche, and her side of the family. His great-great-grandfather was Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the leader of the Haitian Revolution who became the first ruler of an independent Haiti in 1805. His initial title was Governor General. That was later changed to Emperor Jacques I of Haiti. 
Well, that didn't last long because he was assassinated the very next year, in 1806. And also on Joseph Laroche's mother's side of the family was Cincinnatus Lecant. He was Joseph's uncle and the president of Haiti at the time that the Titanic sailed. So knowing how influential Joseph's family was makes it easy to understand why his mother was able to purchase those expensive tickets in 1912. And on his father's side, we find another surprise about Joseph and his daughters and his blackness. His daughters were not half black. Joseph Larage was half black because his father was white. Eusellier Larage, a French army captain. Obviously, having this piece of the puzzle only further explains why Titanic crew members would have thought that Joseph's daughters were white when seeing them with their mother. They practically were white, but for some reason, there was a vested interest in removing all traces of blackness from Joseph's legacy. See this drawing of his family issued after the Titanic sank, and consider that none of the records from the White Star Line call him black, not of African descent or Haitian descent. He is only listed as French. Now, French is just a nationality, not a race, so there is a such thing as a black French person but this drawing makes it clear that no one was supposed to read his name and think that he was black. Let's think in terms of modern day celebrities to give ourselves a picture of what crew members saw when they saw Joseph Laroche and his family. So when someone is biracial with one white parent and one black one, they might appear to be only or mostly black, like Lenny Kravitz. They might clearly look equally white and black like Lisa Bonet or they might look practically white like Rashida Jones. Based on the photo of Joseph LaRoche, he was more like Lenny Kravitz and looked black to people who saw him. That being said, genetics isn't just about looks. And most of the time, when a black and white biracial person procreates with a white person, the child or children look white. They are at least 75% white. Think of the rapper Drake, black and white biracial whose child's mother is white. If one saw his child, not knowing who the parents were, most people would probably assume that his child is white. Same for biracial reality TV personality Ashley Darby and her children. Same for Meghan Markle and her children with Prince Harry. So when we take into consideration that Italians and Irish passengers on the Titanic faced open racial discrimination on their voyage, it isn't hard to imagine that Joseph Raj would have been dealt the same hand. Speaking of their voyage, here is how the LaRoche family spent their final night on the Titanic and their final night as an intact family of four. April 14th, 1912. After a day of socializing and dining with other second class passengers and even some first class passengers, the LaRoche family retired to their cabin for the evening. And just for the record, it's not surprising that Joseph and his family would have spent time with the first class travelers. On Titanic, there were a number of common spaces that were shared by both first and second class ticket holders. And to be clear, second class on the Titanic was first class on any other liner. Recall that Joseph traded in the first class tickets from his mother for the second class Titanic ticket. And because his family's cabin was so large, it was one of a number of second-class cabins that were more luxurious than some first-class rooms. But a few hours after the family was in for the night, none of that materialistic stuff would matter. At 11.40 p.m., the RMS Titanic struck an iceberg, and that was the beginning of the end. A steward came into the LaRage family cabin and told them to put on their life jackets, Joseph woke up his wife and told her that the ship had been in an accident. He put all of their money in his coat pocket, along with all their valuables that were small enough to fit in there as well. Then he and his wife carried their daughters, who were both still asleep, to the top deck. Once there, a steward guided the family to the lifeboats. Joseph was fluent in English and French, his wife only French. So she was confused and had to wait for him to translate directions from the stewards every step of the way. 
at 12.25 a.m. An order was issued to start loading women and children into the few lifeboats that Titanic carried, which were only enough for less than a third of its souls on board. Joseph placed his coat, the one that contained everything they owned, onto his wife's shoulders, then his wife and daughters all made it safely into a lifeboat. As their lifeboat was lowering, Joseph told his family in French, I'll get another lifeboat. God be with you. I'll see you in New York. The last lifeboat was lowered from Titanic at 2.05 a.m. Approximately 15 minutes later, at 2.20 a.m., the ship snapped into two pieces and then sank into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Just days before, more than 2,200 passengers and crew members had boarded the world's largest, most luxurious and unsinkable cruise ship. And then, just a few days later, at 2.20 a.m. on April 15th, over 1,500 of those people were either still on that ship that was making its way to the bottom of the ocean or dying from hypothermia and asphyxia in the freezing waters. Joseph was one of them, dead at 26. His body, along with many others, was never recovered. Some of the wealthiest people in the world were on Titanic's maiden voyage, and many people learned on that final night of the voyage that all of the money in the world doesn't matter if you don't have the air in your lungs, if you don't have life. Unfortunately for Juliette LaRoche, she would have to learn that lesson in more than a metaphoric sense right after she was rescued by the Carpathia because someone stole her coat with all of her worldly possessions, the one that Joseph placed on her shoulders. Remember when I told you this? Another reason that it is important to make the distinction that Joseph LaRoche's family was not a black family, but a mixed race family, is that there would come a time when Mrs. LaRoche would literally bury every trace of blackness that was attached to her and her daughters. Well, when I say that his wife literally buried his blackness, that's what I meant. Literally. As in, Mrs. LaRoche took every photo of Joseph along with every ID card or paper that referred to him as black, Haitian, or African, and she put them in a chest and buried them in her backyard. Let's get into it. So many of you told me that you wanted to know what happened to the LaRoche family after the Titanic sank, along with the family's husband and father, Joseph LaRoche. So, here we are. Joseph met Julia when she was only 15 years old. He wanted to be with her right away, but Juliet's father laid down the rule that Joseph must complete his degree first. So he did. Then, Joseph and Juliet got married in 1908 at Juliet's father's house. Joseph was the biracial son of a white French army captain and a black Haitian mother from an influential family. We know that Joseph having one white parent and one black parent makes him biracial, but in the early 1900s France, he was considered black, and you can see that he looked like a black man. But the rules were what they were. Society considered him black, so he was. He contributed some work to one of Paris's first underground metro lines, but after that, good work was hard for him to find. He was an educated engineer who likely would have had a promising career in a city like Paris. But racial discrimination was a problem that he had to deal with, so he often found himself unemployed or underemployed for a man with his academic background. And underemployed meant underpaid. While potential French employers seemed to have a problem with Joseph's blackness, his father-in-law did not. Joseph lived with his father-in-law, along with his wife, of course. Then, two little ones came early into the marriage. Simone was born in 1909, just one year after her parents were married. Louise was born the very next year, in 1910. Those are the two daughters of Joseph and Juliet who sailed on the Titanic. Finally, after having the family that he created live off of his father-in-law for years, Joseph decided to leave France and go to his mother's country, Haiti, to find engineering work for which he would be properly compensated. 
Joseph's mother came from a very politically influential family in Haiti. To get more information on his background, check out my first video on the LaRage family. It was his family's influence that set up Joseph for success. As a young boy, he was educated by private tutors. At the age of 15, he decided that he wanted to be an engineer, and he left Haiti, accompanied by one of his private teachers, to study engineering in France. Eleven years later, it was time for him to return home, and his mother purchased tickets, first-class tickets, for her son and his family to sail on a steamship called La France. Joseph traded in those tickets for second-class tickets on the Titanic. His plan was to get to New York, then take another ocean liner from there to Haiti, where hopefully he could be gainfully employed. At the time the Titanic sailed, Joseph's uncle, Cincinnatus Lacant, was president of Haiti. He had basically overthrown the government the year before, in 1911. So, if he couldn't secure Joseph a job through good old-fashioned nepotism, he would have been able to pay him out of his own pocket. His uncle's presidential salary was $24,000 per year. That has a buying power of over $700,000 today in 2023. When the LaRoches packed up to leave Juliet's father's house, Juliet was pregnant with yet a third child. All four members of the LaRoche family made it safely onto the Titanic, but only three made it off of the Titanic alive. Juliet and her two daughters. Joseph died with the other 1,500 plus Titanic victims. Juliet remembered that there was a lot of ice in the bottom of the lifeboat because her feet were frozen. She also recalled that one of the people who was rowing her lifeboat all night long was a countess. That would have been the Countess of Rothes, who was depicted in the 1997 Titanic movie made by James Cameron. There's the Countess of Rothes. Mm. After spending the wee hours of the morning in the lifeboat that carried them away from the Titanic, Juliet and her daughters were rescued by the RMS Carpathia. They were hauled up onto its decks in bags, like some sort of cargo. This is Juliet, Simone, and Louise on the Carpathia. While I'm sure that Juliet was thankful to have been rescued, it was just a fact that her life from this point on would not be smooth sailing. One of the things that seemed kind of minor in the grand scheme of things was linens. The Carpathia just didn't have enough to spare. You see, the Carpathia was the only ship that came to help the Titanic survivors. She picked up all 13 of Titanic's lifeboats, which held 705 of its passengers. And the Carpathia was already carrying 700 passengers itself. So now, with the number of people on board slightly more than doubled, there just weren't enough linens for everyone. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think of linens are sheets to cover up for sleeping. But Juliet was the mother of two babies who weren't yet potty trained in a time before pampers existed. She needed linens to make diapers for her daughters, and she couldn't get any because there simply weren't any to spare. So at mealtimes, she would sit on her napkins to hide them so that she could have what she needed for her babies. Anyone else in Juliet's position might have tried to bribe a cabin steward for extra linens with a few dollars. But that wasn't an option for Juliet, because the coat that her husband placed on her shoulders before her Titanic lifeboat was lowered into the water, the coat with all of their money and small possessions that were worth anything, had been stolen from her on the Carpathia. Talk about the worst streak of bad luck. On April 18th, 1912, three days after the Titanic sank, the Carpathia arrived in New York. Juliet was taken to a hospital to have her frostbitten feet treated. While all of these devastating life events were happening back to back to back, one can imagine how stressed Juliet was. Adding to the fact that she was newly widowed, broke, and suffering from medical pain, was also the fact that she didn't speak English. 
She had only been able to make it to the safety of a lifeboat as quickly as she did because her husband spoke English and understood the direction of the Titanic's crew members. So she was likely stressed and confused by the time she arrived in New York. She ended up canceling her trip to Haiti and returning home to the comfort and familiarity of her country and her father's house. At the end of the year, Juliette delivered the child that she was carrying when she boarded the Titanic. It was a boy, and she named him after his father. About a year and a half later, World War I started in July of 1914. Before the war, Juliet's father owned a winery. The war ruined his business and forced their family into poverty. So her father, out of financial options, urged Juliet to sue the White Star Line, the company that built and owned the Titanic, for the damages she suffered. Juliet took her father's advice. It took a few years, but eventually, in 1918, she was awarded a settlement of 150,000 francs, roughly $22,000. That has a buying power of around $400,000 today. She used the money to start a crafting business. Eventually, her father died, and she and her children continued to live at his house. Two years later, in 1920, Joseph's mother traveled from Haiti to visit her daughter-in-law and grandchildren. They had a horrible visit. All of the sources say that Anne treated Juliet and her children like they were foreigners. I don't know exactly what that means. At any rate, Anne Laroche left France and never saw Joseph's wife or her grandchildren ever again. As far as Juliet literally burying her husband's blackness, that happened during World War II, when the Nazis occupied Europe. For the sake and safety of herself and her daughters, it was better if no one knew that she had ever been married to a man who was biracial, a man who would have been identified as black. And it was also better if no one knew that her daughters had any black ancestry. To the naked eye, at that time, they didn't appear to be black. And if no one was asking, Juliet certainly wasn't telling. Juliet gathered up everything that would let anyone know anything about his Haitian mother's side of the family. Pictures, identification cards, legal documents, and she put them in a chest and buried them deep in her backyard. I do find it ironic that Joseph's body was never recovered from the Titanic disaster so that his family couldn't hold a proper funeral for him and bury him. Yet and still, roughly 30 years after his death, he was buried by his family. In a way, at least half of him was buried. His widow, Juliet, never remarried. The two daughters he knew never married at all or had children. Simone died in 1973 at the age of 64. Juliet outlived Simone, which is a tragedy in and of itself to have a parent outlive a child. And Juliet did this despite being paralyzed on the right side of her body. She died in 1980 at the age of 91. Louise died in 1998 at the age of 87. She was among the last of the Titanic survivors. Joseph LaRoche Jr., the son who was born months after the Titanic sank, did marry. He died in 1987. He also had three children with his wife, and his wife lived in the family home with Louise until Louise died. Now, the Titanic was carrying some of the wealthiest people in the world, and some of them led some very scandalous lives. If you want to know about Titanic's scandals in first class, let me know in the comment section. About a decade before the Titanic sailed, another interracial couple carried on with some shenanigans that hit the London papers, and they were a total hot mess. Peter and Kitty Lobengula. I published a video about them that you can see here. I will also leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are Chrissy Hamlin on Blogspot, the Chicago Tribune Archives, 
the Titanic Historical Society, Encyclopedia Titanica, and Kelly Carter from Wellesley College. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ties Too Hot, Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the hot, hot mess history. The link is in the description box.